<laughs> okay, hi. Uh, Jonah, you ready for recording? Okay, great. Welcome back. Uh, what were you talking about last class? Yes, only one person remembers. Objects. 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 Good. So we did the easy part. Okay? We did the part that absolutely everyone agrees about. Okay? The important thing about objects that we can all agree about is that they're basically a good thing and that they are a generalization of lambda. Why are they a generalization of lambda? Why do I use the strange term generalization? They seem such obviously different things. And if you've gone to the paradigm school of programming languages, you know, functional and object oriented, two different paradigms, right? That means it's like, you know, plants versus animals, basically. So how can plants versus animals be like essentially the same thing? What do I mean by it's a generalization of lambda? Generalization of lambda. Generalization of lambda. Anyone? Generalization of lambda. I just mean to generalize lambda. And I also suggest that if you think lambda is an evil thing, then objects are really evil. But you know, since we have general agreement, maybe it's a good thing. Yeah. A lambda can enclose data and do like one thing with it. An object can enclose data and do. Many yeah, things. exactly. So a lambda closes over something, and what I've been trying to explain to you in my in my exposition from last class is that in the same way, an object also closes over things. Okay. I did it through desugaring, but the idea is that this is the same pattern of code. It's the idea of closing over something, and and you know, and in sort of lambda speak, you just it's just a closure. It's just the stuff, right? It's it's static scope. You need to carry this stuff along. You don't have a choice. But in object speak, you have names for all of these things, and names are sometimes useful. You talk about private members, you talk about static members, and all of these distinctions. But it's the same thing. Is the point we're trying to make? Okay. So it's the same thing. Except, except with a lambda, um, a phrase that some people like to use is, there's only one entry point. Right? You always go through the lambda thing. Right? And so that's why in our, in our desugaring pattern, we had to immediately branch. We had to put in a conditional there saying, which of the actual entry points did you mean? Okay? And just for convenience, I gave myself a lambda over there so that I could apply that lambda. But we could have done something different. We could have put the actual code there. This way, each of the right-hand sides could have a different you know, set of arguments. And they didn't need to get conflated with each other. Okay? So it's, once you get in there, the object pattern is which of these different things that you mean to do that are all closed over the same state. Now, our lambda programmers have been doing exactly this for a long time, right? Is getting this value in and then sometimes saying, oh, we need to do a conditional, right? We need to dispatch somehow. But the beautiful thing about objects is that dispatch is built in for you. It's done automatically by the language. You don't have to worry about getting it wrong. For example, if you wrote this as a conditional, you might say, oh, case A, case B, and then else do this other thing, right? Let's say you know there are three cases in the world, right? There's three kinds of things you want to split between A's, B's, and C's. And you can write a con that says A, B, else, right? Okay? Now, in the object world, you would attach this method to A, to B, and to C, right? We know, we know how to do that, right, from our Java programming experience. Which one's better and why? <coughs> yeah. Thing. Why? What, what do you give key? What if someday the world grows to now add D's? Right? So for one thing, you have to sort of go inside the code and modify it. You have to like perform the surgery. But what's worse is you've written this else clause and you might accidentally return an answer instead of returning an error saying, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Right? So you have to be really disciplined about how you write this pattern. And even if you're really disciplined about how you write this pattern, there's still this problem that when there's an extension, you have to go in and modify existing code. Now, do you have to go in and modify existing code? Could you somehow add the behavior for D from the outside rather than going inside? Yeah. Can you just, um, if you're implementing the object with lambda, wrap it in another? Wrapping, exactly. You could write a wrapper, right? You could write something that says, if it's a D, do whatever D things are needed. Otherwise, chain off to the old thing that I had. Right? 
Does that break down somewhere? Does that break down somewhere? Yeah. It starts getting annoying when you have D. Well, I, I extend for D's and someone else extends for E's. And yeah, that's annoying, but it's worse than that. There's actually this funny dualism between writing things as functions and writing things as objects. Okay. So when you write things as uh, functions, we have, you know, um, so let's say we have our data type, D, um, well, okay, we call it, it's got P's, it's got Q's, it's got R's, okay? And now I write a function that takes D kinds of things, and it does some sort of type case on D kinds of things, saying if I'm a P, do this, if I'm a Q, do this, if I'm an R, do this. I'm, I'm purposely using sort of pseudo syntax so you don't get too bogged down in, oh, in this particular language it's going to do this, right? I mean, it's, it's just a pseudo syntax that gets the high level idea across. I've got some data type definition, just like uh, the defined types we've got. I've got a function that takes D kinds of things and it's going to branch over these different kinds of things, right? Okay, now, how would I write this in, in sort of an object oriented way? I would, well, what would I do? I would write. What's the first thing I'm going to do? Interface D. Interface D. That's if you're really object oriented, but if you took like 15 or something, what would you do instead? <laughs> yeah, you just, yeah, you know, what every Java textbook tells you to do. You create a D, right? And this D has what? It has three subclasses. It's got P's, it's got Q's, it's got R's. And now, where does where does f go? Where's sort of fness? Where's it go? It's point. Point. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens is I'm going to have you know probably over here. Um, I may have told myself that uh, I have an f, and so here I'm going to have a method f. I'm going to have a method f and method f, okay? So the code that's over here gets put over there. The code that's over here gets put over there. And the code that's over here gets put over there, right? So the virtue is that this dispatching is done for me not by sort of writing a conditional statement over here, but it's done for me automatically by the language, right? It sort of can't go wrong. There's no way it can go wrong. Right? The language, you know, if it, it's sort of this anthropomorphic terminology again, it knows what kind of object you have, and it sort of knows where to send it. Right? Knows is just a fancy way of saying it has a conditional. Okay? So it has a conditional, it's baked into the language, so you don't have to worry about getting it wrong, forgetting a case or something like that. It just goes into the right places. Right? So what you've lost, you gained something. Have you lost something? What might you have lost? Yeah, um, that's, that's great. What could you possibly have lost? I mean, you're starting to see that maybe there's a little bit of a similarity between these two things, right? As I said at the very beginning of the semester, right? I mean, if you think of this as up down, this is basically the same thing turned by 90 degrees, right? But there's also a trade off. You've gained something which is this conditional for free, and you've lost. It, it, now it's sort of hard to, if, once that's written, it's sort of hard to write G. Uh, what's g? Ah, well, so supposing I have another function, right? So I have a function g, right? And I can write g without changing anything. Now, if I want to write g over here, what do I have to do? What do I need to do to write g on the right-hand side? Oh, I, so I have two alternatives, right? One is I can write like a, you know, uh, P prime that says here's G, right? And so the P case of G would go over here, right? But now D doesn't seem to know anything about G's, right? If I look at the type interface that I've been given, and even if I wrote it as an interface, um, it's not there, right? So I have to create this new interface and I have to remember to talk about the new interface versus the old interface, you know, the new thing versus the old thing. So on the left-hand side, it's a real nuisance to update my data type. On the right-hand side, it's a real nuisance to update my set of functions. 
Now, anybody who's done some object-oriented programming knows there's a simple solution to the thing on the right-hand side, right? If you keep adding new kinds of functionality over a data type, you have this problem that, you know, my, my interface or my superclass doesn't list all of them, and, and it's not very extensible, and it's a real pain, so, um, in fact, it's worse than that, because let's just say that Q over here made new instances of P's. What's it going to make an instance of? Well, at the time when Q was written, all it knew to do here was to say new P, <coughs> right? That's, that was the last kind of P that it ever knew about. But now I've got this new kind of P prime. So unless I go and modify the code, I'm going to make a new P, and if I say new P dot G, it's going to say, I have no idea what that is, right? So the new P that comes back that Q might return doesn't know anything about G, and so I'm going to get an error. And this was exactly the error that Java was trying to prevent me from having, right? Method not found is exactly the error I was trying to prevent. So, not so good, okay? So how do I get extensibility back of functionality on the right-hand side? If I'm in Java and I want to have lots of functions and I don't want to prescribe what that set of functions is, prescribe, right? Prescribe, to write down beforehand. If I don't want to prescribe the set of functions, how do I get that kind of extensibility on the right-hand side? If you're in Java, for instance. Pattern. Yes. The visitor pattern. V for victory, exactly. Right? <laughs> the visitor pattern. What does the visitor pattern do? What's the visitor pattern do? The visitor pattern rotates your code by 90 degrees. Okay? What does visitor pattern look like? The visitor pattern says. I'm going to take the same code, and instead I'm just going to have this one method called visit, or visitor, or whatever, right? There's different conventions for how you write this down. So I'm going to have this one method, right? And everything has to implement this method. And what I'm going to pass in is P is going to say, what's P going to say? What's the visit method of P going to say? Anyone? Visitor? Yeah. It takes a visitor, which... Right, so visit is going to be, visit is going to take uh, uh, visitor B, yeah? And what's it going to do? V dot visit this. Yeah, V dot visit of this. Right, and presumably return. I mean, you have to deal with all the type nuisances, but that's, that, that's a separate issue, right? Just in terms of code pattern, because it may not return values, maybe void, whatnot, okay? So then, then there's ints and, you know, the objects, whatnot. So that, that, those are Java-specific <laughs> things. But the important thing we're going to do is we're going to have this visitor method, and it's just going to say, give me something that has all the right behavior, and I'll just dispatch off into it, okay? This is sometimes called a double dispatch. Because there's a dispatch that's happening. I, actually, I'll show you what the double dispatch is in a moment. So what is a visitor now? What's a visitor? Yeah. It's the fun fact. Yeah, so a visitor, a visitor, is going to have what? It's going to have a visit of type P. It's going to have a visit <coughs> of type Q and a visit of type R, right? Three pieces of code that are going to look an awful lot like that. Functions. We have functions, yes, OK? Um, and furthermore, <laughs> what do you lose now? Supposing you add a new kind of data type, it's really easy to add a new data type here. Is it easy to add a new data type here? No. So the point is. Functional programming and object-oriented programming, sort of as traditionally set up, are essentially duals of each other. It's the same pattern. You can't escape from this problem of extensibility. All you can do is like twist it in one direction or the other, depending on which direction is more advantageous. Okay? This problem of this, you know, here I'm creating a new instance of P, so it's not going to know anything about P prime. That same problem shows up over here as a problem of I'm making an instance of this function that doesn't know about this branch that I that I'm potentially making. Okay? The way out of it, the way to break out of it, is to use the same self-application that we've seen before. 
So we talked about self-application in the case of recursion. You saw self-application about making objects at the end of the object nodes. Okay, it's going to turn out that that's the key. If you do the set bang self trick, what you're doing is you're saying, I have this object over here, and I have this object over here, but self here is mutated to be this object irrespective of any future improvements, extensions that might be made to it. Right? So self over here is going to point here, and so if I go to the super and then ask for self, which one am I expecting to get, the upper one or the lower one? Believe it or not, in Java you're expecting to get the lower one, right? So this is like one of the fundamental tenets of object-oriented programming, is that the self is this open thing, right? Somebody, somebody on Piazza, for example, asked, what is open recursion? That's what open recursion is, right? This thing here is a closed recursion. You're recurring back on yourself. <laughs> open recursion is when I say self.m, and I get the m that's down over here, okay? And that means the easy thing that I showed you, the thing that's familiar to you, which is the set bang pattern of just mutating yourself to be yourself, that's not what objects actually do. It's just there as a red herring to set you up. I do this, I'm sorry, I set you up a lot. Okay? So it's there as a red herring. What you actually have to use is the open recursion pattern, which is self-application, where every method takes a self as a parameter, right? And that way you can keep passing the same object as a parameter all the way through, rather than the mutation which prematurely commits you to the wrong object. It commits you to the right object for now, but then that ceases to be the right object when extensions happen. Okay? So object-oriented programming is trying to give you two kinds of extensibility. It's giving you this ability to extend the data type without anybody having to, anybody's code having to change. Okay, and that's like an extensible um, con. Okay, it's also giving you the self-recursion pattern where you know references automatically go to the newest version of the object, which is like an extensible let rec, right, or define. It's like you can open up the definition to new definitions. So that's really nice. And if you're designing a language, it's good to think about how can I make life easier for my programmer. In particular, how can I make it easier to do black box extensions? Right? This is what makes ecosystems. This is what makes product ecosystems. You, in, you release your initial version of a game, and then you know, you've got like you know, characters and like spells and things like that. And then somebody comes along and says, hey, I know how I can make your game better. I can add new kinds of characters that you didn't imagine. I'm going to add you know, witches, and I'm going to add, you know, the, well, I don't know, Harry Potter stuff. Uh, for Joe can help us. Okay? Um, and then somebody else comes on and says, I can add new kinds of behavior that you didn't imagine. I can add the casting of spells, or I can add, you know, turning something into a toad, a warty toad, or something like that, right? And those are new kinds of behavior. And those are two different kinds of extensibility. One is adding new data types, the other is adding new functions. Unfortunately, you're going to have to make a choice about which one is going to be easier to do. Uh, which one's going to be more important to do, and optimize for that case. And once you've made that decision, then there's the question of how do you encode that decision in your programming language. Right? First you have to make the decision of which one you want to enable, then you have to make the decision of how to encode it in your language. Now, it's in fact kind of an open research question how you can design a programming language that enables both kinds. Um, Racket's module system actually gives you a really easy way of doing this, except the type story is not very good. If you want all of this with full type checking, that's more or less an open research question. So, so you're really at the cutting edge, you're at the frontier of research, but you can also now start to see what programming language research might be about. It's about taking, for example, important software engineering patterns like the one I just described, and making languages so, for instance, we can get static type checking that tells us about all the missing pieces of code before we start to run it. Okay? And that's, that's really at the frontier. So there's a lot of different dimensions along which, uh, once we get past the agreement on objects, right? Objects are these things that have like a, a self, and um, you know they 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 have their multiple entry lambdas. That much to me is completely uncontroversial. There's no good reason to not have that in most languages, and most languages do have them. Once you get past that, is where all the controversy lies. For example, we've been writing our objects as case m. You know, some name over here, some name over here, 
okay? If there's two names. What's the thing that's missing here? What's the thing we could have written and it's missing? It's a bit of a trick question, obviously, because it's not there. But what could have been there? Else. Else. Yeah, yeah. I could have said, Assuming this is not the complete specification of the object. And that opens up a whole bunch of questions. What goes over <coughs> here? Because we have the distinction between classes and prototypes, where Prototypes are classes are basically saying, I mean, you all know what classes are. I don't need to tell you what classes are, right? So here the idea is I'm going to chain off to essentially a super object that is my own private copy of the super object. And in the in the textbook, I worked out the code pattern to show you how classes actually work, where essentially what what actually happens in principle is that. I, when I make a new instance of the object down here, it makes a new instance of the super and a new instance of the super and a new instance of super all the way up. Okay, And so you get this private copy of the objects all the way up the inheritance chain up to the top. Okay? Now in practice, of course, a Java compiler doesn't have to do that because your Java compiler has enough static information that it can collapse all of those into a single object construction. It can say, look, this one's overridden by that, this one's overridden by that, and I have a total of you know, three fields here, two fields there, two fields there, so I have a total of seven fields. So I'll just make one thing with seven fields and start creating three different objects and taking you know, forever to construct this object. Okay? So your Java compiler can and does, in fact, do that. But in principle, it's essentially making a private copy of the objects all the way up. Okay? In contrast, with prototypes, it's arguably a much simpler system because it simply says, it's just an object. Okay? You give me the object, and if I don't find the message over here, I will just delegate to that object. I'll just call off to that object and say, you find me the method. Okay? And then classes become a special case of prototypes in that it's a prototype where the prototypical object got cloned before you passed it here. Okay? You made a copy of the prototypical object before you passed it here. If you don't make a copy, then everybody shares the same prototype. And this is the kind of fun you can have in JavaScript, right? Everybody shares the same prototype. So if one object decides to go and mutate its prototype, everybody else sees the change. Right? So this is a very powerful feature. Powerful is a polite term here um, for something else I would like to say. Uh, because it means that you have no modularity. You have no guarantees. Okay? You don't really get to control what happens to the object that, whose behavior you're inheriting. Okay? If, you want, if, you want, if you want a lot of fun, you, know, you can do things like you know, here. I've got like, you know, cat prototypes and dog prototypes. And you, know, you create instances of cats and dogs. And you can go into your cat and like, mutate it to the dog starts barking and it stops meowing. Right? And you have no control over that. There's no immutability thing you can say. There's nothing you can do to protect yourself against somebody else coming in and destroying your prototype and changing your behavior. Okay? So that's, that's one of the downsides of prototypes is this excessive sharing by default. And classes have the opposite problem, which is no sharing by default. And then you, you know, we talked about this principle of languages should be designed by removing restrictions rather than adding features. And you could view like, you know, static members and things like that as simply something that had to get created because you were given no choice but of having a completely fresh object here. Right? If you have no choice about a completely fresh object, well, then you're going to have to do something to recover the sharing that you lost. Prototypes go to the other extreme and say there's no shared, there's, everything is shared, and so you have to recover something that says, please give me some defense against the rest of the world. Okay? It's called cloning. Now, just the comment that the mutable prototypes thing is one of the things that gets filed under took several years to fix in a new version of the JavaScript spec. So you can get around that problem now, but it was one of the major things they had to work on realizing was a mistake in fixing in the spec. So. Like the internet admitted the mistake. <laughs> the internet. It spoke. Yes. <laughs> then there's another question, right? What's the other thing that's missing over there? <laughs> I'll give you a hint. It's on the same line that's missing, that, that we added. The blue line. 
Quick question. What am I, what's missing? How many blue blobs have I drawn there? <laughs> yeah, why only one? I could have two, I could have three. Right, so now we get into single inheritance versus multiple inheritance. Okay? This one is pretty unqualifiedly a mistake. Okay? It's just this is this is one of these ideas that sounds really attractive for like the first 10 seconds, and then you wake up and start thinking and you say, oh my god, what a mess. Because okay? first of all, you have to have an order of lookup. You need an algorithm for the order of lookup. Then you have all these questions like, well, supposing I have, um, some of you are young enough that you don't even know that these used to be problems, and in a way that's good. But I'm just telling you this, not as things you should emulate, but as mistakes you should avoid. Okay? So I have a class D over here, and it inherits from C, and it inherits from D. Okay? So far, so good, right? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> okay. So first of all, there's a question of, if I look for a name and it's not in D, where do I go looking for it? Right? Do I go looking for it in B or do I go looking for it in C? Um, well, so you could say, well, I'll go left or right. That sounds pretty obvious. Um, what if B and C both inherit from A? Ooh, bad. Because which A do you mean? Is that one copy of an A or is that two copies of an A? If you have one copy of an A, then you have to, then, well, if you have two copies of an A, that sounds pretty nice, except, you know, uh, if you have sharing, now you have a problem because the sharing's broken. If you have only one copy of an A, that sounds great because sharing's no longer a problem, but it means now, you know, C used to go to A, but C no longer goes to A because B already went to A. Or do I visit A twice? Do I visit A once? It's, oh, stuff makes your head hurt. And now, in a way, you know, head hurting is good for programming language designers, except it should be like useful head hurting. Okay? Um, and and spend a little while studying multiple inheritance if you're ever tempted, and the feeling will pass. Okay? That's, that's all I want to say about that. Um, then there's another really weird one, really weird design trade-off. Okay? Everybody's programmed in Java and use super, right? Super. Super! It says so in the name! It's super! It's awesome! Right? In fact, it should just be renamed awesome, right? <laughs> awesome.m. Right? Um, what could possibly be controversial about that? I mean, you've got a chain of stuff and you want to invoke the stuff above, right? It's... Exactly! Nothing's controversial about it except... <laughs> well... Here's a question. When you create a subclass of a superclass and you define, you have an M in the superclass and you define an M in the subclass, you've all done this, yes? Was your goal in the subclass's M to replace the superclass's M or to refine it? Ah, it's not a question you thought about. Was your goal to replace it or to refine it? You, you understand that this is actually, it's, I'm, I'm playing with words, but it's actually an important distinction, right? Replace means I'm just changing the behavior. I can do whatever I want. Refine means I'm augmenting the behavior in some way, right? My constructor creates a hash table, and the, my, you know, my, my extension wants to make sure that the hash table has some property to it, right? That there's like, you know, certain kinds of duplicates or your chaining is handled in some way or something like that, right? So, so this is a common thing you want. You claim you want to do. You want to do behavioral refinement. You want to slightly augment the behavior. I don't want to completely change its behavior. That would be terrible. Why would it be bad to change its behavior? It would be a terrible idea to change its behavior. Because anybody who's expecting the super and gets a sub now gets, you know, the wrong thing. Literally the wrong thing. Okay? This is like the one thing you're not supposed to do in object-oriented programming. Well, super says that the lower, more, lowest thing on the totem pole, right, the most refined thing, gets control. It chooses when to call it super, and it can actually choose to not call it super, right? I mean, in a constructor, there are some rules about calling super, but in general, a method can choose to simply not call it super. But the thing above is maybe trying to enforce some invariance. And it's, you know, it's, you know, it's, pro it's programmed to like check for some invariance, maybe repair some invariance, put some invariance in place. And if the thing at the bottom chooses to not call it because it doesn't know about them, we get broken programs. So 
a good question to ask is, what if we inverted the order? What if instead, when we call a method, it goes to the topmost version of the method, and the topmost version of the method gets to call the ones below it? Because then it also gets to clean up, right? You know, it calls something below it, something below it goes and does some wacky thing, and it says, no, 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 you're not supposed to do that. And then, the, you know, when it returns, it can say, oh, now I can clean up what was there before. This is, a, this is a very intriguing design suggestion. Um, it suffers from having a bad name. It doesn't have an awesome name like Super. It has a terrible name called Inner, and that's why it never won. Well, maybe that's not the only reason. Um, so Inner is this idea that, in fact, control always starts at the top and goes down rather than starting at the bottom and going up. Right? It's kind of, it's, it's sort of super flipped around. And there's this Norway. How many of you know anything about Norway? Exactly. Okay, this is the Norwegian School of Programming Languages, and it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting uh, culture because they sort of have their own unique way of thinking about programming languages, and it's sort of everything's just a little different. Um, and Inner comes out of the Norwegian School. There's actually a language called G Beta. See that the marketing is clearly not there to strong suite. Um, G Beta, which actually implements Inner, it's, it's a live living language. It's got some really cool features to it, and it's something worth looking into. G Beta is really awesome. Okay, it's got some interesting things about uh, you know the unification of objects and closures, classes and objects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And one of the things it does is implement Inner. So again, if you're thinking about a language, you think about preserving in invariance. This is something you should be thinking about. I want to spend the rest of class talking about another question that's related to classes. So I'm in Java. What have I just defined? I, I know, I know, this sounds like a total trick question, right? What have I just defined? Subclass. A subclass? A class, a subclass, something like that? Why do you say subclass as opposed to class? Because it has a parent. I guess it's also a class, a subclass is a class. Yeah, a subclass is a class. Let me ask you a different question. The stuff between the brackets. What's that? Is that a class? Yeah, I know, I know, you're like afraid to say anything because you have no idea where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? It's a unit of extension. Okay? It's a class extension. And you know that because it says the word extends right here, right? that's your giveaway. That thing between brackets is a unit of extension. Okay? But what the notation and mecha mechanism of Java has done is it's <coughs> conflated two distinct things. It's conflated the act of extending with the thing that is being extended. Right? It says this is the extension but I'm also going to pin down exactly what it is extending. I would extend B and absolutely nothing else. That's what it says. Why? It sounds like a dumb question, right? But it's, it's, not, a, it's not an unreasonable question to ask. Why does it choose to do that? Yeah. You have to know something about um, superclass in order to know when to call super. Ah, ah, there's a great answer. There's a great answer. If I didn't say that I extended B, well, like, I'm, you know, one of the, one of the unmiss, unmissable attributes of Java is that it's statically typed, right? So my type checker is gonna go over the body that's sitting in dot, 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 and it's gonna try to report type errors. So if I now say, you know, super M or something like that, how is it gonna be able to report a type error if it doesn't know anything about the super class? It obviously can't, right? It obviously can't. It's completely obvious that it can't, possibly. Ah, ah, what did I say? Did I say it needs to know the superclass? It needs to know that it has the method 
I said it needs to know, more generally, it needs to know about the superclass. Now you're thinking, oh my god, he's really playing funny word games here, right? But, but there's an important distinction, knowing the superclass versus knowing about the superclass, right? Is there a thing in Java that tells us about classes? Templates. Simpler, simpler. In Java, Java, no templates. No templates in Java, right? <laughs> is there a thing in Java that describes classes without telling us exactly which class it is? Interface. Yeah, that's what interfaces do. Interfaces describe classes without telling us exactly which class it is. So you could imagine a different mechanism that says, uh, so I'll call it a class extension, A extends <coughs> I, which is an interface, okay? and now I have the usual stuff that I have. Now, does this recover what I need? It tells you which methods are available. It tells me exactly, it gives me a description about what's sitting up there without telling me exactly what is up there. Yeah. Right? So now I can go ahead and type check the body over here relative to what's in I without having to know exactly which superclass it actually was. Right? Yeah? But another problem is that when you're writing a subclass, a lot of times it and its superclass need to share implementation details. Ah, well, we'll get to that in a moment. Okay? Yeah. So now I could actually write class, uh, so I'll call this uh, A extension. Okay? So class A, I could now say is A applied to B. So A extension is essentially what have I done here? I've made it a parameter. Right? I made the superclass a parameter, and so A extension can now be applied to B. Well, okay, whoop de doop. I've now taken twice as many lines to write the same thing. But what new power have I gained? Yeah. Yeah. I could instead write A extension applied to C. What is the thing that needs to be true of B and C? Same interface. Say that again? Same thing C, part of the same interface. Or invocations of the same interface. Yeah, so both B and C need to implement I. That's it, right? They both need to implement extension, implement interface I. And anything that now implements interface I is now open, you know, is now open to be put over here. So there's actually a name for this concept. It's called mixins. Okay. Mixins are the idea that a class should not def explicitly mention who its superclass is, but rather should define an interface so that you can get something that is in fact more extensible, more reusable. Right? It's not a coincidence that I used a function like syntax over here. It's saying that class extensions are useful in their own right and can be applied in lots of different contexts. Okay? One of the subtle things about mixins is that they actually help us solve the problem that we ran into earlier with this extensibility thing that I showed you, this two-dimensional extensibility problem. Mixins give us a solution to that. And there's a pointer to, the, to a paper that describes that in, in, the, in the textbook. Okay? I don't have time to go into it here, but, but that's, that's one of the benefits we get out of them. But that's a bit, um, sounds a bit abstract, sounds academic. Why would you care about mixins as a working programmer? What use could you possibly have for mixins? Well, what if you program in Swing? <coughs> yes, program in Swing? Okay, good. How many of you write GUIs in general? Yeah, pretty much everyone has written or will someday write a GUI? Yes, good. Talk about GUIs for a moment then. Let's talk about <coughs> text editors and GUIs. And every GUI library has a mechanism for creating a text editor, right? In HTML, for example, you say text area, and you know, every every GUI has how many different kinds of text editors are there? What is he talking about? The text editors, right? <laughs> What, what variations there between text editors? 
Is there, any, there, there are multiple kinds of text editors? Yeah. I mean, there's ones for like typing your paper, and there's ones for typing code. And there's... Okay, so there's paper versus code. Okay, pa uh, paper meaning like text, you mean? Like yeah, document layout. Yeah, yeah, document. Okay, so, and why are they different? Because they have different formatting options. Yeah, so docs versus code, right? Because how you know bold facing and indentation tab characters everything's a little different right okay any other distinctions yeah which keyboard shortcut do you use keyboard shortcuts okay um, you mean that's the distinction docs and code no or oh just which set of keyboard shortcuts do you want do you even want any keyboard shortcuts yeah right um, what's a <coughs> what's a text editor where you want uh, What's a text editor where you want minimal, if almost, no keyboard shortcuts? Keyboard shortcuts are awesome, aren't they? I'll let you think about that for a moment. Yes. Oh, just another. Hold oh, on, hand up, hand up. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, there are text editors which are constantly passing the text to whatever is going to do something with the text, and ones where you have to like click a submit. Yeah. Okay. So continuous versus uh, uh, sort of batch, right? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the character encoding. Yeah, character encoding. Okay. What else? Anything else in the feature space? Um, so, did anyone have an answer to the keyboard shortcut question? Yeah. An iPhone text editing. iPhone text editing. What about it? Probably wouldn't want keyboard shortcuts. Uh, well, yeah, it's almost <laughs> But think about a text editor where you really, really, really care about not having weird keyboard shortcuts. Maybe in a browser you don't want to conflict with the browser shortcuts. Browser shortcuts, passwords. Right? You pretty much the only keyboard shortcut you want is paste. You don't want anything else because you don't want to like accidentally keep hitting a key and you know have because you can't see it, right? So visibility. Right? Can I see the character? Wait, a text editor where you can't see the characters you can type? Yes, actually really useful, really important. Right? Um, other characteristics? How about this one? Spell checking? What could possibly be wrong with spell checking? Programs, right? They're full of typos. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a whole design space of text editors. Each of these, this is sort of like you can imagine there's a kind of tree of possibilities, right? <clears throat> some of these trees are like, you know, you can have both of these, you know, you can have this or this, and some of these are you can have this and this. And, and this is an entire sort of complex space. Like certainly, if you have a do, a code text editor, you don't want spell checking for it. If you have a document text editor, you may want spell checking for it. Um, but if you have like a password editor, you certainly don't want spell checking for it. Right? You really, really don't want spell checking for it. So some of these things are correlated. Some of these things are uncorrelated. And you know, there's there's you know, we've already seen one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven features, right? So if these were just binary choices. How many different kinds of text editor classes would we need? Exactly. Okay. Now, can you imagine at least one more feature? Yes, which means we need at least twice as many more classes. So just think, I mean, if you had like 10 features, you'd have to have 1,024 different classes. I mean, I understand that Java docs are not particularly known for modesty of size, but even then, right, 1,024 classes. Does this make sense? No, of course not. Nobody provides 1,024 classes. They give you like five and say, live with it. <laughs> Deal with it. You know, so you get things like this, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? And you know, here's of course your little Y Combinator discussion about it. But there's a really insightful comment that goes that comes over here. Right? For the record, I've spent lots of time. Blah blah blah. Java makes a, well, sorry, okay, pardon the language. Um, that said, I have nothing against Java or folks that enjoy doing it. I don't. Um, but even when it was a language that I was knee deep and stoked on, I was able to laugh at some of the sharp jumping complexity of these, and this is the critical phrase, <coughs> Cartesian products of patterns that would arise. Cartesian products. Very, very insightful comment. Cartesian products. Because that's what happens, right? If I give you seven different features and you want to combine them, I have to look at all the combinations of features, and I have to give you a class for every single one of them. Okay? Or I could give you mixups. 
I could give you a mix in that says, I have a text editor that implements the text editor interface. I have, um, nobody mentioned coloring, by the way. Right? What does coloring do? Coloring takes as its input a class that implements a text editor interface and provides, implements a class that implements the text editor interface. Right? And now I can compose coloring. Right? So I could, I could basically obtain the same kind of effect by saying, That's what they're trying to say. They just don't have the machinery to say it. Because you can only have the sort of one level of, you know, everything's sort of got to be glommed in there. Right? They don't have the ability to compose. They don't have the ability to think of classes as being more like functions. That is, a class thing is just a class extension that describes a reusable piece of functionality that can be applied to different base classes that satisfy the interface. So you talked about the fact that, well, a class sometimes needs to depend on the implementation. Right? In fact, that could be viewed, that's a double-edged sword. That could also be viewed as a bad thing. Because if you've now relied on the implementation of something you don't control, when that implementation changes, you're going to break. Right? Anyone, anyone heard of the Design Patterns book? It's the only the most popular software engineering book of the entire 1990s. Right? And people got rich off this book, and people don't usually get rich off computer science books, I can assure you. Um, so, you know, this, this is like a really profound book because it says, here are ways to arrange your code that bring order to an unordered universe. Okay? And one of the most important dictums in that book is, Program to interfaces, not implementations. The machinery in traditional class-oriented programming doesn't give you the choice. You don't get the choice of saying, you know, I want to think of, I don't want B, I want to think of this abstract entity there that provides a set of services that I want to somehow extend and hopefully refine. Okay? It doesn't give you that machinery to say that. It gives you B, and there's nothing in your code. There's no like code smell, right? There's no when you're typing, you don't suddenly get like a red squiggly underline saying, "Hey, do you realize you've actually relied on the actual implementation of B, and if B changes, this code might break?" Now, it might be nice if your text editor told you that, because then you don't have to worry about the brittleness of code. But given that it doesn't, well, in fact, we don't even need our text editor to do that. Because if our language let us do it, then it doesn't matter what area, even VI, would, VI doesn't do squigglies, does it? It probably does by now. Does do, Vim do squigglies? Vim does, VI. Vim, okay, Vim. okay, even VI could be your text editor, right? With no squigglies underneath. <laughs> That's the nice thing about building it into the language, right? So what mixins are doing is giving you the ability to turn classes into something more like functions. And they give you the ability to take GUI libraries and other libraries that have this combinatorial explosion problem. Start observing. Now that you've heard me talk about this, the next time you go program against some large library, start looking for the combinatorial pattern. Right? Ask yourself, they gave me this and they gave me that, why didn't they give me this other thing? And the answer is because it's just too painful. In contrast, in Racket, for example, the entire GUI library is arranged in terms of mixins. It actually has something called mixins and something called traits. Traits are like, you know, mixins done a little better because if you have multiple things you want to extend and their name clashes, you have to worry about it, but if there are no name clashes, you can extend multiple things. So it's slightly less linear, which is nice, um, as long as you don't have clashes to worry about. So in Racket, for instance, the GUI library ba is based on this idea as a fundamental concept. So what you get are these reusable pieces of extensibility that you can extend and they, you know, they have interfaces and you say, this is the interface I extend and this is the interface I provide. And now you get like object-oriented programming done better. Right? It's what it was trying to be. It was trying to give us these reusable pieces of compositional pieces, and now we can get reusable compositional pieces. So the point of this exercise is partly to give you an idea of how OOP, where OOP could go, but also to say, look, you've written a line like this like thousands of times. Right? How many classes have you defined in your life? Collectively in this room, like a million classes maybe, right? <laughs> But it didn't occur to you to stop and ask why. 
Why do I write that over there? Why don't I write something else? And this is an example of that dictum of languages should be designed not by piling features on top of features, but by asking why is that restriction there and does that restriction make sense? If I generalized it, if I'm allowed to use a type, a class as an interface name as a type, why don't I put a type over there, which allows me to write an interface name? You could even have a language that says, if you really want to put a class there, because you want to rely on its implementation, you can put a class. But we suggest you use an interface instead. And you know maybe you have classes and mixins. And interfaces are what you get with mixins. Classes are what you get with classes. And a code auditor could come along and say, why is that a class? Why isn't it a mixin? And you have to justify your choice. Right? That's what language does. So this is another example of programming language research. Right? Saying, let's not, you know, things look pretty good as they are, but just questioning some simple assumptions leads us to very different points in the design space. Okay? One of the neat things you get if you design your mixins just right, by the way, is you can use a mixin twice in a hierarchy. You can't have a class twice in a hierarchy. What sense does that make? It's crazy talk, right? It doesn't make sense. It really doesn't make sense. But a mixin actually makes sense to use multiple times in a hierarchy. And one of the things I do in the, in the book is I give you a pointer to a paper that gives you a working illustration of exactly why this is useful. So, so again, a taste of PL research um, to round out our discussion about objects. We're going to get back to objects again in plenty more detail when we get to type systems. So this is sort of the untyped view of objects right now. Okay. Questions? Good.